that was Michael. Welcome back, everybody, um, to the second part of the last part of um, our Meister trilogy today. So I am so pleased to introduce Katie Hosbein um, to our speaker session today. Um, Katie um, did her PhD with Jack Barbera um, in Portland State, and she's now um, postdocing with Joy Walker at East Carolina. She has um, received several awards, teaching awards for outstanding teaching from Portland State and positive attitude from Ball State. And her track rec record to date is that she is an absolute measurement pro. Uh, <laughs> she's worked with factor analysis and structure, structural equation modeling expertise in the context of um, the measurement of identity in chemistry education research. So she's really impressive in publication so far. So Katie, um, I will pass it to you to take over. Yeah, so let me share my screen. Hope We'll see if any co-presenters uh, show up. Um, all right, now presenter mode. You'll have to let me know, is this working now? Oh, that's great, so, okay. thanks. Okay, um, yeah, so as Ashling said, uh, I really have focused my PhD on measurement. Um, and so when I was asked to talk about the more qualitative portion of my work, like I was really excited because usually I talk about measurement, which will not be lacking from this talk, um, but I'm going to be talking more about the kind of front work that I did in my study. Um, and so I want to take an, oh, oh, I also don't mind if you post anything on Twitter. Uh, that's fine. You can at me. Here's my Twitter handle. Um, so I want to take a note from Stacey Lowry Bretz and start with my acknowledgements. Um, so this work was done at Portland State with Jack Barbera, uh, otherwise known as Twitterless Jack. Um, and his group is pictured here on the right. And his group is really, you know, instrumental, pun kind of intended, in my work. Uh, and as well as the biology education research group at Portland State headed by Dr. Aaron Shortledge, they really helped me to develop the qualitative portion of my study that I'll talk about today. Uh, and last but not least, thank you to my postdoc advisor, Dr. Joy Walker, who um, supports and encourages me to participate in things like this, even though I'm not talking about her amazing um, work in labs and developing science practices in labs. So watch out for publications on that. <laughs> so I want to start with uh, the overall concept of measurement. Um, and so when we're thinking about measurement in terms of bench chemistry, we're thinking of things that are more, that are observable, directly observable. So something like absorbance, where you use a law, like Beer's law, you develop an instrumentation based on this law, and you directly measure a compound's uh, absorbance using a UV vis spectrophotometer. But when we move into this realm of affect, we're measuring things that are not directly observable. So something like motivation. But this is still grounded in theory. So there are many theories of motivation, and an example of one is self-determination theory. And we can use this theory to develop an indirect measure in the form of a survey. And so what I'm going to talk about today is really this connection between theory and survey development. And to do that, I first need to give you this very oversimplified primer on measuring affect. And as I go through this, I'm going to kind of throw up some definitions. So we've been discussing affect this morning, but I want to define it as any experience of feeling or emotion ranging from suffering to elation. And I'm going to read these because, sorry, Vanessa, I know you don't like being read through, but I enjoy it. So I'm going to be reading, reading things off my screen to you. Um, so measuring affect. So theory is crucial in the measurement of affect. And I just want to have us start thinking about um, theoretical frameworks and theory. And so if you picture this image, this pixelated image as a theoretical framework, and I'm going to define a theoretical framework which consists of concepts and together with their definitions and reference to relevant scholarly literature, existing theory that is used for your particular study. So a theoretical framework is really this amalgam of theories that you're using to ground your study in. And if you think of this pixelated picture as a theory, we can pull a square out of this picture and get, get some information about it using the pixels. But even if we have four different unique pieces of information, if they're of low resolution, we still can't tell what the picture is. Um, maybe you can, but you shouldn't be able to. Um, and as we get more resolved, 
you can start to tell and get more information about this image through each square. And as it increases in resolution, you can tell that it's a picture of Beaker. Uh, staying on Disney theme for this talk. <laughs> um, so let's replace this picture of Beaker with an affective construct like chemistry identity, which is what I'll be talking about. And chemistry identity uh, has been tied to persistence in, in chemistry. Uh, and it's, I'm going to define it here as being recognized as a certain kind of person in a given context. And so you could think of chemistry identity as being recognized as a chemistry person within a chemistry context, such as a classroom. And if we think of that same idea of gathering different types of information in these different boxes, um, if you have a resolved theoretical framework, these boxes of information give you uh, important, valuable information, and we can call them constructs. And so a construct is an, explan an explanatory concept that is not itself directly observable, but that can be inferred from observed or measured data. So the more resolved these constructs are, the more information that we can take to create our indirect measure of the construct. And so what we do with this, with these resolved constructs, are create survey items that tell us something about them when students answer questions relating to them. And I keep saying that the constructs are more resolved and what I really mean is that they're more operationalized. And so operationalization defines a fuzzy construct as to make it clearly distinguishable, measurable, and understandable by empirical observation. And yes, this is from Wiki, but it was the most clear definition that I could find of operationalization. So again, we create these survey items based off these operationalized constructs, which are reflective of our theoretical framework. But how do we judge the quality of how well the items relate to the construct, as well as how well the construct relates back to our theoretical framework? Well, we use quality. So in the same way that we have to calibrate our UV viz to gather absorbance data, we have to calibrate our survey to gather data about the construct of interest. And we do this through um, validity. And so if you read about validity in the literature, there are so many ways that it's conceptualized, um, but I'm gonna be describing it in the more modernized way, which is under this umbrella term of, of just construct validity. And you can show construct validity in multiple ways. So the first is content validity. So making sure that the items that you've designed are reflective of your construct. And that's usually uh, judged by experts in that field. Response process validity. So making sure that the items that you've created are being interpreted in the way that you intend them to be interpreted by the population who's taking your survey. And this is usually explored through uh, cognitive interviews. Internal structure validity, which is um, something that uh, Jack Robera's group focuses a lot on, um, as well as the other aspects, but I think we're known for the internal structure validity part, where we use the um, field of psychometrics to show that the structure of our, the hypothesized structure of our instrument is in fact uh, the structure of our, of our hypothesized instrument. And so we use psychometrics to do that. And then relational validity. So chemistry identity is tied to persistence. So if I'm measuring chemistry identity, I should be able to show that it, it is indeed tied to persistence. And we can do this through regression analysis and correlations and other statistical methods. The other part of evidence um, for measurement quality is reliability, which I'm not really going to get into today. Uh, it's, but it is equally as important as validity in, in your measurement quality. So I want to bring us back to this more simplified picture of what I had up before and point out that content validity and response process validity can really address both of these pathways. They can tell us how well our items reflect our construct and how well our construct reflects our theoretical framework. While internal structure validity and relational validity are more focused on the measurement portion and how well your items reflect the construct. So what this means is that you can find an instrument in the literature that shows evidence of all of these types of validity, but it only addresses this portion of the diagram. It doesn't mean that it addresses this portion of the diagram. And so this portion that relates the theoretical framework to the construct, as well as content validity, is what I'm going to focus on today. Um, and so I'm going to take you on my journey of measuring identity, and only part of it. It was a very long journey. 
Um, but so I'm just going to talk about kind of the beginning part. But first, I want to ask you, you can answer in the chat, what does your identity consist of? <laughs> okay, so I'm saying first generation. <laughs> Elizabeth is made of carbohydrates. <laughs> Dog lover, cat mom, self and external perception. You are, <laughs> Elizabeth, you are what you eat, yes. Cats, personal experiences, educator, learner, chemist, chemist, physicist. Depends on the environment, absolutely. Yeah, so Rachel brings up a good point. It's very intersectional. Making things, learning things, doing things, not all chemistry. Millennial, wife, returner to STEM, Hufflepuff, <laughs> human. Yeah, so multiple people have said that it depends on the environment, depends on the day of the week. Immigrant, chemist, educator, mum, Aspie, Ravenclaw. Okay, so the point is, is that none of you are wrong. <laughs> you all have, you know, incredible things that make up your identity. They're so intersectional. It's a huge, it's an extremely con complex construct. Um, and so, you know, there are multiple identity theoretical frameworks that you could use to frame your study. So you have social identity, you know, if you're an athlete, a baker, an artist, you have your racial identity, your gender identity, and I'm showing the genders here overlapping because we know that um, gender is not binary, as well as institutional identity like a chemist or a doctor that uh, hinges on some institution. And so, oh my God, starting, I feel like studying identity as a PhD student is very meta. You have to like think about how, what your identity is and how you're going to study it. Um, but what was most relevant to what I wanted to study was to focus on chemistry identity. And so we have to narrow our focus of identity in order to really measure something and get something meaningful out of it. And I want to be very transparent that we will definitely be leaving things out of identity. I'm not saying that this is an all encompassing chemistry identity, but it is where I wanted to focus and how I chose to narrow my focus. Um, and so in order to build this chemistry identity framework, I started in the literature uh, with science identity. And so there's this science identity framework developed by Carlone and Johnson in 2007. Uh, they performed a, longitud a longitudinal qualitative study that uh, involved 15 women of color in STEM. And there, before this study, there was this just amorphous definition of science identity. And Carlone and Johnson were interested to kind of understand a little bit more about what goes into science identity and more clearly define the theory. And so they um, followed these women from their late college career, their late college to early science careers, and found that there were three constructs that were important in identity formation. And so the first was recognition. So whether or not the women saw themselves as science people or others saw themselves as science people. Competence, so knowing of science material and performance, the social performance of relevant skills. So like communicating science uh, or using instrumentation. In 2010, uh, the Hazari group uh, built upon the science identity framework and operationalized it to physics. And so they had three goals to operationalize uh, the theory to physics to make it a little more generalized to a larger sample so that they could measure it quantitatively. And so in order to operationalize it, they slightly changed the definitions. So recognition became uh, recognition by others as being a good physics student. Competence became the belief in the ability to understand physics content. And performance became the belief in the ability to perform required physics task, tasks. They also uh, added a construct of interest because while Carlone and Johnson had said that interest um, was important in identity formation, the women that they were studying were further along in their careers, so their interest was more stable. Whereas the Hazari group 
was interested in students who were more in their early college career where their interest was um, less stable and therefore of, in, of, of interest to measure. Um, and so, for example, an example of items that they used, recognition was measured using my parents see me as a physics person, my friends see me as a physics person, and my physics teacher sees me as a physics person. And this was given on a Likert scale. Um, they distributed this survey to 13,000 students in the US. Uh, I want to know their secrets to getting this type of sample size. Um, to both STEM and non-STEM majors, so they distributed, distributed it in a um, English course in college. And what they found through factor analysis is that students weren't really distinguishing between competence and performance. So whether a student was able to understand physics content versus perform well on an exam were not seen as different constructs to students. And so what they decided is that this is really one construct. So the physics identity framework now can, consisted of interest, recognition, and competence and performance. And this has been applied to uh, not only physics, but math and engineering as well. So taking you back to the different types of validity and how to kind of assess these affective assessments, um, the physics identity framework survey had really good evidence for internal structure validity and using psychometrics to show that their measure, you know, the items that are measuring recognition were indeed measuring recognition uh, and so on for the constructs. So the internal structure validity was there. Relational validity was also there. They showed relations to um, between identity and career choice, um, which were proposed to be related. But what I found that was really lacking was this content validity and response process validity. So how did they get the items that they got from the construct of recognition? And this really made me think about what, well, what does recognition mean? And I felt like the definition within the past literature was, um, was not as defined as I wanted it to be. So what I thought was going to, I was going to be able to build this very resolute, uh, resolute, I did this in my practice talk, <laughs> resolved uh, chemistry identity framework. I, what I found were constructs that were a little more, were a little less resol resolved. Um, and so I wanted to look into uh, how can we more clearly define these constructs to develop measures to get at one's chemistry identity. So this led me to my overall research question, which was how can we address the content validity um, of the physics identity framework to create more grounded measures of identity? And this was done through two research questions. So first I asked students questions that pertain to the physics identity framework and I can um, operationalize them to chemistry and science. And I wanted to know what themes came out of those interviews. And then the second question is, to what extent do the themes that I find overlap with theory that is already established in the literature? So I did this in three steps. I first interviewed students, then I looked at the themes through the interviews, and then uh, compared those themes to theory. Um, and so to start, I interviewed nine students from Portland State. And again, with transparency, I want to say that this is, these are not, this is not a lot of students. This is not a big sample size. Um, but we also weren't developing a completely new theory. We just wanted to kind of elucidate what was already there. And so in order to get a variety of experiences, I sampled from multiple chemistry courses and I used quota sampling. So quota sampling, um, to do this, I, I gave the three courses uh, two items and I had students respond. So I picked one student from each course that had selected agree to strongly agree to these two items. I see myself as a science person and I see myself as a chemistry person. I selected one student from each course that uh, had strongly disagree or neutral to neutral responses and one student from each course that had a mixture of the two. And in these interviews, I first asked students what makes someone a science or chemistry person. So I asked them about science as well, because while we're interested in disciplinary science or disciplinary identity, I, I also wanted to get an idea of like what was going on in their overall science identity. 
And I have combined the terms here because sometimes when I would ask them what makes someone a science person, they would conflate their answer with chemistry. So I didn't always ask them um, science and chemistry worded versions. So I started with this overarching question and then I took the physics identity items. So my, for example, my friends see me as a science or chemistry person. I changed them into a question to ask the students. So do your friends see you as a, as a science or chemistry person? And then I asked them, how do you know that? Um, we then transcribed these interviews. So I, I asked them, um, I just want to clarify that I used all of the physics identity framework items. And then we transcribed the interviews and used thematic analysis. Um, and so um, David Reed had talked a bit about the steps of thematic analysis. And I want to go through kind of how we actually used it. So the first step is to generate uh, codes through iterations. And so my undergraduate researcher and I, this is Amanda Schmidt, uh, we went through the transcripts and just started memoing patterns that we saw. So for example, this question was, do people who are important to you see you as a science person? And we independently looked at the answers and would just kind of pull out patterns that we saw. So this person said, yes, I mean, my parents are always encouraging and supportive of me. So I pulled, I pulled out, you know, that this person said that their parents are encouraging and supportive and Amanda was seeing similar things. We then started forming more defined patterns. Uh, so something that we were seeing a lot was that students would describe science in terms of their feelings. So, you know, being excited about science or enjoying learning science. We then took the patterns and made more official codes. So we would code something that with feelings if we saw in a transcript that a student was describing positive or negative feelings associated with, with chemistry or science. Uh, after generating all of our codes, we used a code book <clears throat> to go through the interviews and we found 12 codes. Once we had our codes, we looked at the relations between them to see if there were any overarching themes that encompassed a set of codes and we found four. And so I'm going to walk you through the themes. The first theme that we found is that interest in science or chemistry is based on feelings or values and it occurs in stages. And so once we had a theme, we wanted to look in the literature and see if there was any theory that overlapped with our themes. So we could ground it in something that was a little more concrete. And we found two different theories that overlapped with this first theme. The first was that was feeling and value related interest. And so feeling and value related interest states that interest is based on your feelings. So, you know, whether you're excited about something, but also your value, whether something, some, something means something to you um, can uh, aid your interest. And so an example of this is Steve, who says, I come home every day after class just psyched. The other day in biochem, we're learning about Warburg shifts and cancer cells, and I'm just wide-eyed and innocent. Oh, I love it, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, but he's using feelings to describe his interest. And an, in an example of value-related interest is through Barb, who says, well, learning science and doing science for me is so that I can go into the health field. And so I think that's fulfilling for me to go help people in the future. So she's using her value to describe her interest. The second theory that we found that overlapped this theme was the four phases of interest. And so this is comprised of four different phases, the first two being situational interest rela related. And this says that the environment that you're in can still affect your interest. It's still developing. Where the last two phases are individual interest, where your interest is more internalized and less likely to be affected by outside sources. So an example of situational interest is Barb, who says, sometimes I do enjoy chemistry, I enjoy the lab, I enjoy learning some of the concepts and some of the real world aspect of it. And so you can see here that her interest is still developing and it's, it seems to be dependent on the course content. Whereas Robin says, I mean, it's a way to understand the world and I love to kind of know how things work. And I think it's also a way to help people. And so her interest seems to be more internalized um, at this stage. The second theme that we found was that educational experiences contribute to student science or chemistry identity. And this theme overlapped well with the concept of mastery experiences. So mastery experiences is one source of self-efficacy, self-efficacy being your judgment of, cap of your capability to complete a task. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the skill you have to complete that task. 
but your judgment of your capability. And one source of self-efficacy is mastery experiences. So whether or not you do something well can influence how you feel like you could complete that task in the future. So an example of this was that Max says, you know, I've always been good at science. I think it's something that I can be successful at. I've always gotten mostly A's and a couple of B's in any scientific area. So her mastery experiences uh, has to do with how, how good she is at, at chemistry and, or science. And then Karen says, my friend see me as a chemistry person be mainly because I was really good at it. So again, they're uh, referencing the, their experiences. The third theme that we saw was that students gain information about identity through interactions with others. And so the, this theme relates to two other sources of self-efficacy, verbal persuasion and vicarious experiences. Verbal persuasion being whether or not someone tells you that you're good at something or whether or not someone tells you you're bad at something can influence how you feel uh, that you can complete a task. And this was shown through Nancy who says, you know, my peers are like, oh, maybe you're not good at this. How are you gonna get through it? Whereas uh, vicarious experiences are, you know, seeing someone else perform a task, you base your capabilities on that person. So Steve says, you know, I was the only one in our group that got a C. My other friends in the study group were just chemistry geniuses. So he's basing his experiences on uh, watching other people. The last thing that we found um, was that participation in science or chemistry takes a certain kind of person, which overlaps well with the theory of mindset. Uh, and so there are two types a fixed mindset where you believe that your intelligence can't really change. And students were kind of describing being a chemistry person as, as some type of trait. So an example of this is, you know, I think my brain just isn't equipped to be able to deal with those kind types of chemistry problems. You know, they don't think that they can develop into this person. It's just a trait. Whereas growth mindset, uh, you believe that you can develop and that science isn't or chemistry um, being good at those things is not a trait. <clears throat> Where Robin says, you know, I don't think it's a special skill per se, it's more about grit and just committing. Uh, and I want to point out at this point that the, these themes and theories do overlap with one another. So for example, the vicarious experience example that I gave um, also shows evidence of a fixed mindset. So, you know, Steve says, my my other friends in the study group are just chemistry geniuses. He's acting as if they have something that he doesn't. So to conclude with the research questions, um, you know, that we found four themes that arose when uh, students were discussing the physics identity framework in terms of science and chemistry. And we found multiple frameworks within the literature that these themes were overlapping with. Uh, and to go back to the physics identity framework, um, we found that the, the theories that we found in the literature relating to our themes overlapped really well with the physics identity framework in terms of elucidating what they meant. So for example, interest aligned really well with situational interest, recognition aligned well with verbal persuasion and vicarious experiences, and competence and performance aligned well with mastery experiences. We also found something in addition to alignment with physics identity framework, which was this, this um, concept of mindset that kept coming up when students would talk about their identity. And so hopefully what we've done is taken this less resolute uh, framework of chemistry identity and just made it a little more clear. So what I want to say about this too is that this uh, image of chemistry identity will never be fully resolved. Uh, it, it's something that will always be developing and you know we took a reflexive approach to thematic analysis which means that we acknowledge our subjectivity in this as well. And so, you know, there could be more things that come out of it. Um, but in order to get some idea, um, in order to measure chemistry identity, we have to start defining things. Uh, and so this is the direction that I was taking. And so the first, the paper that I had you read and what I just described really has to do with um, this portion of the diagram where the theoretical framework aligns with the construct. Um, but I have, however, looked at a few measures of these constructs, and this is um, in my second paper that's also in SERP, um, and it is a very intense structural equation modeling paper, um, but in case you're interested, it is there. 
So I want to move on to a scenario. So after, now that I've explained, you know, my journey with, with finding an instrument in the literature and talking about validity and reliability, how would you go about assessing an assessment? So say you read that motivation is correlated to success in chemistry. You're interested in how motivated students are in your classroom and you find five motivation surveys in the literature. How do you decide what measure is most appropriate for your classroom? How do you know that that measure measures what you actually think it measures? And so I want you to just pose some of these questions in the chat. I'm going to give you about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm seeing really good responses. So yeah, thinking about maybe needing to pilot um, the question. So interviewing students in your course, um, what aspects or theory of motivation are most relevant for your research questions? It's a great one. Um, what population was used to build the survey? Does it reflect the population in my classroom? I've seen that one a couple of times. Yeah, again, how do students understand the prompts? Is it tied to a theory? In what context have the survey been employed? Is there validity and reliability evidence? <laughs> yes. Is it published in a high-ranked peer-reviewed journal? <laughs> that <laughs> That's opening a can of worms here. <laughs> Are any of the surveys chemistry specific already investigated in a chemistry context? That's a great one. How does my context match the context that the survey was developed in? Absolutely, Justin. Whether the instrument has been adopted by other researchers in similar context and published? When the instrument was developed, were experts consulted? Were students interviewed? You guys are taking all of my advice and you already know what to do. <laughs> yes, having a well-defined question in mind and talking with peers about how well it aligns with different instruments. Really good, Rain. Who do I know that knows more about this than me? I should go talk to them to help me understand what I need to consider. Jeff. You're on my same page. I do the same thing. Yes. Okay. So everyone, I think this is, this is great. Um, I think everyone has a, you know, an idea of, of what to look for in a measure when you are interested in using one and, and how to choose it. And these were the questions that I kind of just came up with in the top of my head. So where did the items come from? Um, were the, what theory supports the use of the measure? So the question in, in terms of motivation, I went back to motivation just because it's, it's a little more um, familiar of a concept than chemistry identity, I assume, to most. And there are multiple frameworks of motivation. So the question that you have is really going to depend on what theory of motivation that you use. So is the, is the instrument that you're using aligned with the theory and the questions that you have um, with motivation, which was something that came up well in the chat. Um, so for which populations or po population or populations was it designed? Um, does the validity evidence exist for the population you're interested in? And I want to point out that these are not trivial questions. Um, these are questions that require a lot of digging, a lot of thought. Um, I, I know that, you know, the, a lot of times when I use a survey, I want it to be short. I want it to give me 
uh, meaningful information. I want it to answer all of my questions. I want it to measure what I think it's measuring and to, to really be able to answer those questions is not trivial. Um, and so something that is conveniently happening in the background um, is something called the Chemistry Instrument Review and Assessment Library. So um, Jack Barbera, Jordan Harshman, and Regis Comparda have an NSF grant to compile this assessment library for the field of chemistry education research. So what they're doing is looking through the literature at instruments that exist, and they're pulling all of the validity and reliability evidence that exists for those instruments. Um, and also having peer reviewed summaries of that as well. So you don't have to wade through it yourself. And this is something that's ongoing, it's not ready yet. Um, but if you want to keep an eye out, subscribe to the CER listserv at um, cer.chemedx.org. Uh, and, and this is a great listserv to be a part of, period, in the chemed community. Um, there are jobs that come through, there are events that come through. Um, everything you need to know to stay up to date with CER comes through that listserv. And so Jack has said that it will be very well advertised when this is ready. Um, so you won't have to do all of the digging yourself. So I want to go over some take home messages um, that, you know, if we don't look into the validity of affective measures that we're using, then what are we really measuring? What are we saying about our students uh, in these surveys if we if we don't have evidence that they're measuring what, we're, what we think they're measuring? I also something that I didn't completely focus on but want to drive home is that psychometrics provide a really powerful tool, but they must be guided by theory. So like I said, you could find a really high quality instrument that addresses multiple aspects of psychometrics and I think in our field or all aspects of validity. And I think in our field psychometrics can is a, is a powerful tool that is often focused on, but sometimes it can lack the other types of validity that really make this connection of the construct to, back to the theoretical framework. Uh, and so psychometrics is a beautiful tool, powerful tool, but it has to be guided by theory. And that it may not be necessary to show all types of validity, um, but you need to justify why you're not using some and not others. And so some instruments aren't designed with psychometrics in mind. There are certain observation protocols that you can um, validate the data of, but not you, you don't need to use psychometrics to do that. Um, and I just want to leave on a note, um, just show you this quote that I think really summarizes my thoughts of theory and practice. And um, thank you to Ashling and Michael, uh, otherwise known as the Zoominator now. Um, and thank you all for I, what I'm sure was your complete and undivided attention. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. That was really amazing. Yeah. Chasing validity for such nebulous and con complex constructs is, is far from an easy thing to do, but you um, kindly gave us a really comprehensive and clear description of that and how the, the theory can align to and how it needs to align to the methodological implications. So um, I've taken so much from your talk and thank you once again. Thank you so much. Right. So um, we are 